Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Laszlo. I'm head of equity origination for technology, media, and telecom at Mizuho Americas. Welcome to our series entitled Blind Spots, in which we evaluate the continuously evolving role of the chief financial officer. I am delighted to welcome today Glenn Shipman, who's the chief financial officer at Fanatics. Prior to that, he was the chief financial officer and executive vice president at IAC Interactive. And prior to that, he spent approximately 25 years as an investment banker at Guggenheim Securities, the Rain Group, Yamura, and Lehman Brothers. Glenn and I had the good fortune to work together at Lehman Brothers through the late 90s and early 2000s. I am delighted to welcome him, which I'll do in a moment. But first, let me talk quickly about Fanatics. So Fanatics has constructed one of the world's most transformative companies and is building a leading global digital sports platform. It has created an interactive and lasting fan experience with, with which it engages its partners who have a much better direct to consumer relationship as a result. I'm extremely excited to hear what Glenn has to say on both the evolving role of the chief financial officer, but also as to what he has been helping with at Fanatics and what the company is doing. I mentioned partnership in my opening comments, so I'd like to talk a little bit about that uh, in more detail. Uh, Fanatics has been in the news recently uh, through establishing some very dynamic partnerships. Um, the University of Alabama comes to mind, uh, Nike, Dune Collectibles. So I was wondering if you would comment a little bit about the importance of those partnerships and how they continue the evolution and transformation of Fanatics as a company. Yeah, look, it, at its core, it's our raison d'entre. Um, without our partners, we'll be, we'll be nowhere. You know, I wrote a shareholder letter uh, to our to our shareholders, of course, hence the name um, this past year. And I, I concluded it by saying our first love is to our customers. As well as our partners. And if we cherish that love affair and delight our customers and add value to our partners, then thereafter and as a result, our shareholders will return that love. But it starts with our partners and our customers. And we do, we're, we're, we're so fortunate to have a great roster of partners uh, for a lot of reasons. They've grown over the years, but mostly because we've delivered. And what we do with our partners is, is, is we take a very collaborative approach and we say, hey, let's grow the category. Let's grow the number of SKUs. We, by and large, help them monetize their IP. Uh, monetize their brands, monetize their logos. And we've said, let's increase the number of SKUs. Let's put a logo on anything and everything that we can. Uh, and let's give you a piece of the action. So they get a royalty share or a rev share. Um, in addition, our partners in a lot of times are our shareholders in our company. So 10% of Fanatics is actually owned by the leagues, the players association, the teams, uh, whose IP that we monetize, and it's broad-based. Uh, you mentioned Nike as well. You mentioned University of Alabama. You know, University of Alabama, we actually run these stores as well as the websites. So you go to University of Alabama and you go to the Fanatics flagship website, and they look exact same. So they're they're powered by our Commerce Cloud platform. Think, you know, Shopify for uh, for sports. And that partnership with, with Alabama transcends everything they do in commerce, of course, and everything we, uh, we do uh, across, across college football. Um, our partnership with Nike, we produce Nike merchandise for many of the leagues, for the NFL, for MLB, and for college. We have the Nike brand here. We pay them, of course, for that brand, but we take care of the design, the manufacture, the distribution, of course, and the selling of that. So again, our partners are, are everything uh, to us. When we bought tops um, from the prior owners, uh, one of the prior owners was on CNBC. And he said, I'm focusing on my own IP because I never want to go on an airplane ride to try and get the rights from someone else. We kill or die to jump on that airplane to get rights uh, because more rights, more products, more ability to delight our customers and more ability to give our partners more uh, more value. Where, where would you say you are in terms of uh, the partnership relationships? Are you scratching the surface at this point and there's almost infinite amount of partners that can be created or is there a focus more on the 
what I'll call large cap partners, you know, like a league or something like that? Where, where do you see it going from here? Look, it's all of the above. Often in business, when you get into something and you start going deep, you realize it's a lot deeper than you think. So we think our TAM is well north 30 billion and our commerce business, our sales will be four and a half billion. So just based on that math, we have a lot of market share yet uh, yet to take and a large adjustable market, which we can continue to uh, mm-hmm. to penetrate. Um, so we're in the early earnings, we believe, but the opportunities across the board, yes, there's some bigger deals with some of the leagues where we could take on more rights, but also there's, you know, there's the team here and the team there. International tends to be a little more fragmented. Domestically here, it tends to be a little more, you know, top down. Uh, so yeah, Andy, it's it, it's it's all we above. Can you comment on Fanatics plans to potentially expand into the sports betting business and whether that becomes a meaningful part of the portfolio or not? Yeah, uh, and, and product is not just additional businesses like betting, and I'll answer your question, but products could also be the number of SKUs that, that we sell. So you have a nice jacket on, you have a nice collared shirt, I have a collared shirt on. We could have a logo on this, right? And given how casual you know the, the world has become, plus your passion for your alma mater, you and I went to Duke, like we should have a blue devil over here or we should have a blue devil here or, um, you know, uh, your tie that, of course, you don't have on. You could definitely have a blue devil tie on today. So there's so much more to do within the business. Two Thursday nights ago or was it last Thursday night? I forget. The Bengals had a whole new uniform. They had a white uniform with black stripes. It wasn't for me. I don't think it looked very nice. But you know what? That's a whole nother opportunity for us because there's going to be Bengal fans that say, wow, I want that. And you know who they come to, uh, you know, where they go to get it? It's from us. So it's innovating in our core business. And you can never stop innovating uh, in your in, in your core business. Yes, you can expand into other businesses and we are, but you always must innovate in your, in your core business or, you know what, you know, your competitor or, or, or your next competitor. will. in terms of online sports and I gaming, yeah, we're going to go there because when we built the commerce business or as we built the commerce business, we built three irreplaceable assets. One, we're the best database in the fan. You talked about the emails that you get from us after the victory, because we know you, we know you're a Duke grad. We know you have a son at Notre Dame. Uh, we know, you know, maybe we know, or have picked up that you may be going to the game this weekend uh, against Stanford. So we should be hitting you with an email saying, Hey, don't you want a new hat or don't you want a new shirt or, uh, or a new, or a new Jersey. So we got a great database with billions of attributes. That's one, two, we got, we think the number one brand of the fan as per the polls that we do for aided and unaided awareness. And three, we have, Getting back to your first point, we have great partners and irreplaceable relationships with the leagues and the teams whose IP we help monetize. So with those three advantages, we think we could, and and a great management team, by the way, that we hired, this uh, gentleman, Matt King from FanDuel, great management team we hired. We think we could build a differentiated product, and by using our brand, our league and team relationships, and our database, have a differentiated offering to the fan at a better price point from a marketing perspective than any other competitor in online sports uh, and, uh, and I game. We think it's a natural extension of what uh, we do, just like the trading cards and our collectibles business was a very natural extension of what we can do. When we went to the leagues and the teams, sorry, the leagues and the players association, we said, Hey, let's do something different in trading cards. Let's replicate the success we've had in commerce and apply it to collectibles. And that is, increasing the number of collectors that is going direct to consumer and you know take partially taking out some of the middlemen and that is making it a better experience for the collector so change evolution uh you know the more things change the more they stay the same right so you're you're growing you're, you're changing but the core fan base the core competency remains Were there specific things that you found that you had to personally adapt to? Like, how did did you have to change your behavior in any way as a CFO joining in that kind of environment? Or was it sort of just, as you said, keeping a heavy handle on the numbers? Or maybe that was the shift. Anything in particular that you found you had to change? 
You know, I, I think I have always worked with companies that were much more advanced. Uh, when I was uh, a banker, by and large, you're working with public companies or companies on the eve of being public. When I was a CFO in my prior company, we were already public with hardened systems and, and hardened processes. And I think what we now are doing at Fanatics, we've grown incredibly quickly. You know, uh, a decade ago, I think we had 200 million of sales. This year, we'll have well north of five and a half, maybe even six billion of sales. So we're putting the infrastructure in place, putting the systems in place. In fact, when I got here, and I got here to help transform the business from the commerce business to a multi-business business, a global digital sports platform. And we actually had to create a holding company to house our businesses. And we didn't, our businesses didn't even exist. I actually was employee number one at the holding company because our chairman and CEO hadn't even taken that job. He was in his personal holding company, hadn't dropped in. So, you know, I had to stand up a whole corporate infrastructure, hire over 100, 100 people, and, you know, create the companies, create the subsidiaries, create the, the processes, create uh, some things you take for granted, an audit committee, an audit committee charter, an internal audit function, a corporate top-down accounting function, a corporate top-down treasury function, an IR function, an FP&A function. So anyway, that was the new thing for me. I always presided over things, you know, hopefully uh, made these things better over time hopefully had, had worked well with these functions. But now at Fanatics, I was creating uh, the function from, from scratch. All right. So you're giving me wonderful transitions to, to my next topic. So you've got a very diverse set of experiences. You know, you've worked at both bracket investment banks. You've worked at boutique investment banks. You've you mentioned IEC, a public, large, you know, global media conglomerate. How how has the aggregate of all those experience helped shape you and prepare you for your role as CFO at Fanatics? Yeah, I think they 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 all did. You know, every day I look back to aspects of my career, things I did, decisions I made, deals I did. And I've pulled back from that treasure chest of experiences. Uh, and, and that guides me to this day. I, I often, as I advise people on their career advice, you know, I, I say you're building a toolkit. Um, and, you know, you want as many tools in your toolkit as possible. And you want to learn how to use all those tools. And the analogy is apt because a toolkit is portable, Right. A person who has a toolkit, you know, a mechanic or a handyman, they carry it from house to house, from job to job. So the, the, the analogy is apt. And over the years, I learned how to use a lot of tools um, and I, 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 I learned how to use those well and used a lot of different tools. So, you know, in some respects, all of my career, you know, has been in preparation uh, for this job. We had a board meeting the other day. And some, one of my colleagues said, hey, are you preparing for the board meeting? I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll prepare. But kind of I've been, I've been working on this board meeting since 1991. You know, like at some point, Fanatics will go public. I did my first IPO in 1991. You know, we've done we, we did a debt deal last year. I think I did my first debt deal in 1992. We did a couple M&A deals last year. Yeah, I think I first did, did my first M&A deal in 1993. Yes, I'm, I'm fortunate to be working, you know, at a place where I can take all those reservoirs of experience, carry my toolkit around. And that's, I think, the key to it all is as you build a career and as you go through different experiences is learn as much as possible, be a sponge as much as possible, because you, you don't know when you're going to need those experiences. And it's nice to have that reservoir to draw from. You know, when Lehman went bankrupt, that's another incredible experience, a, a, a big crisis, a big leadership moment uh, for myself. Um, when I was running Asia at the time, I had 300 people who were reporting to me. Um, and I, you know, personally managed the sale, of course, with my partners, personally managed the sale of the entire Asian business, 3,000 people, saving 3,000 jobs, including including my own. Um, but that, at that point, you know, that was all my M and A experience, and all my managerial experience, and all my leadership experience was uh, was was tested, and we obviously delivered for our employees and, and 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 for the creditors. But but those created a great set of experiences and leadership moments and, and, and managerial moments that I've you know continued taking on to this day. 
So you may have, in a sense, answered my next question, but I'll, I'll start by rephrasing, which is, you know, sage advice, right? I think for everybody in the you know, never stop being a sponge, never stop learning, because the moment you stop evolving, you just stop, right? So, and I think that's a, exactly what you're saying. You may have answered this question with the, with the Lehman bankruptcy story, but I was going to, or I will ask you, and you can change your answer if you'd like, is there a particular experience, i.e. maybe that was it, skill set or lesson learned that you find has a particular influence on how you execute your duties today at Fanatics? Oh, there, there's so many. I mean, the Lehman experience is, is a great one where, you know, as I said earlier, in times of crisis, everything becomes more so. Um, crises is reveal character. They don't create character. Um, and, you know, as when, when things get really difficult, you know, you slow things down. You know, and you, of course, need to come up with answers. Of course, you need to come up with solutions, but you need a whole heap of empathy along the way because somewhat other people may not be as thick skinned or other people may not be as experienced. Um, so that's a great moment, you know, uh, for me, for sure. My first deal this is a great funny story. I was, I was telling, I don't know who I was telling this the other day, maybe my kids or something or probably not because they don't listen to me. But my, the first deal, um, no, sorry, I was at, I, I met someone who was involved in this deal at a party and I did end up telling my kids this story. Uh, it was the first deal in 1995 that I negotiated on my own. I think I was 25, 26 years old. We were selling this asset um, at Lehman Brothers. It was a cable system. And my managing director, we'd gotten all these bids and, and the auction was falling apart. But finally, we convinced one person to, uh, to, 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 to buy the asset and we got them to a, to a decent price. And now we have to negotiate it, finish the deal. I say to my managing director, okay, uh, let's order a car and we'll go to the lawyers. She's like, uh, you can do whatever you want. I'm not going, you're doing the deal. And I never negotiated a deal on my own. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, she said, you know, it's all you good luck and don't F it up course great great advice right, right. um so I, I i rock up to the law firm and it's my client and i'm a banker right my client uh the, his l l lawyer there and got the, the other side has bankers and has principals and has their private equity bankers so it's like two against ten so i said to john who's was a uh, my client I said, it was like seven or eight o'clock at night we're gonna finish this deal we're gonna negotiate this deal to this time i said john you know like I'm an associate. Like I'm either going back to the office and pulling a red eye and doing work, or I'm here as a red eye and I can outlast anyone in this room. I guarantee it. Cause I'm just used to doing red eyes all the time. Um, not sorry, not red eyes, pulling an all nighter. <laughs> and I say, this is how we're going to win. Let's just keep saying no. And let's just keep slowing this down. They're going to get antsy all night. These guys can't handle pulling, pulling an all nighter. And let, let's just torture these guys all night and we'll get exactly what we want. So, we kept going and going and going. So it gets back to that advice of slowing it down, understanding who you're dealing with, understanding the counterpart. Anyway, you know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, get going on this. And I keep saying no to everything and they keep caving and they keep moving forward to us. Anyway, we got a, we got a hell of a deal. Uh, but I often remember that time in every deal I negotiate that slow it down understand what your leverage is or isn't and then maximize your advantage and don't let someone use time against you always use time as your ally again this was yeah this was 1995 and i remember the deal like it was yesterday it taught me a lot yep yep i've got uh i've got similar memories of, of a deal that i did at lehman in london but um this conversation is about you so i i will i will spare the audience my story Let me shift gears to the expanding role of the chief financial officer. So as a banker, you know, I interact with a lot of CFOs and you'll recall this. It's literally like probably number one or two on the job description is meeting with CFOs. And it's very apparent to me that uh, over the last, you know, pick your time frame, three to five years, let's say, that the role of the chief financial officer has materially evolved. I find more and more that CFOs have some level of operational responsibility and in some cases, even PL responsibility. You know, so this is well beyond number crunching and 
putting out results, right? It's you're in the in the thick of the business now in a way that you may not have traditionally been. So that's my experience. So my first question is, do you agree? And the second one is, how have you seen the role of CFO evolve during your tenure as a CFO? You know, so look, any job is what you make it. So depending on the person um, and depending on the situation, you, you, you can take the job in a lot of different directions. The CFO is a privileged seat. Like that, that's just a fact. Um, you have unfettered access to the board. You have unfettered access to the CEO. Um, and you're the CEO's right-hand person, full stop. So you have significant uh, influence, you know, whether it's uh, the reporting lines or not. By and large, you help allocate capital. By and large, you uh, approve most, if not all, uh, things that involve capital. Uh, so, yeah, that has clearly evolved over time. I've seen um, to a true partner, to the yeah. CEO, and to a true consigliere uh, to um, uh, to uh, to the board. Um, I think that's exactly right. I think at the end of the day, though, it's the CEO, the CFO, who makes the job, not the title, who uh, who who gives you the responsibility. You know. I think the CFO's job, full stop, is to help the CEO, the business leaders, and everyone at the company, including the board, make better decisions, okay? And that means you need perfect information. That means you need that information at your fingertips. That means you need to be able to see at around corners. And that means you need, not to poke fun at the title of this podcast, that means you need to be make sure you have no blind spots. All right. Right. And I'm going to I'm going to ask you about blind spots uh, in, in the last uh, set of questions. Um, before we depart uh, the expanding role of the CFO, I just uh, want to give you an opportunity to share any specific insights from your experience as a CFO. It might be around, you know, preparing for a, you know an earnings call public company. It might be around how you manage partnerships today at Fanatics, just, you know, particular insight that may not otherwise illuminate itself. Oh, it's a, boy, that's a broad question. Um, look, in terms of earnings call prep, that's a lot. What I used to do at IEC, I spent a ton of time on earnings call prep, but it wasn't really earnings call prep. It was the four times a year where I went super deep in all of our businesses. And that laid out, in my mind, the plan for the next quarter and for the next year. So, you know, I'd lock myself in my office the, the, the two weekends before um, earnings, literally Saturday all day, Sunday all day, Saturday all day, Sunday all day, you know, so four weekend days, four times a year. And that was, of course, to get me ready for the earnings call. But again, more was to really without distraction, rip apart my businesses, understand my businesses, figure out what are what the business's blind spots were that I was going to try and solve, what the priorities were, what have we done well, what did we miss? And um, I use that as, as, as just a wonderful time to, again, be level set and go deep. And then that would set my agenda for the next 90 days. Right. So... Perfect. Um, never can under understate, underestimate the value of the deep dive, understanding the business, the core business that you're ultimately responsible for, particularly as financing is always a key part of that. So you've mentioned blind spots a few times. We've named the series blind spots exactly in order to highlight the obstacles that a CFO may face that's, you know, out of view, or as you put it, you know, hiding around the corner. So you've shared, of course, many insights already illuminating, you know, would be blind spots, but I, I want to put you on the spot and just ask you, what do you think is the single biggest blind spot that a CFO may face? Most likely confirmation bias. Um, you know, you have a set of beliefs. Um, the human mind is such that you look for affirmation. You look for data that um, confirms, you know, your beliefs. You tend to surround yourself with people who think the way you are. And that's, I think, the most important thing is to, is to surround yourself with people who think differently than you. 
um, is to just sometimes for sport, take the other side of an argument. And what's the true sign of intellect is to be able to argue both sides of the uh, argument with equal intensity uh, and accuracy. So I think that's really, uh, really uh, important. Um, and, uh, you know, not be afraid to, uh, to say you're wrong um, or to, uh, to um, you know, give up that firmly held belief when, when something more accurate uh, yeah. or more uh, appropriate comes up. What I've said about, you know, a great working relationship with a CFO and a CEO, they need to be, think, similarly enough to be efficient and different enough to be effective. Right. Any um, any recent cases in point that that you want to share on the topic that uh, highlight what you just said? You know, at Fanatics and at IC, it was a culture of um, what's the term? Psychological comfort, where it didn't matter if we were right or wrong. By the time you're done debating it, you forget even what your position was. Is the winner is the position and the right answer. The winner isn't the person who suggested it. So as long as you have a culture with Again, I think the term psychological or yeah, I think it's psychological comfort where it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to throw a stupid idea in there, but it's not okay not to participate in the debate. If you're not participating in the debate, get out of the room. You shouldn't be invited to the meeting. I agree, right? If you don't have a voice, you don't you don't get a say. What advice would you give to a newly appointed CFO on how to identify, avoid, and if unavoidable, address, you know, the would-be big blind blind spot? You have to, in all of the functional lines, you have to be knowledgeable enough um, to, not on every issue, on any one issue, go as deep as the people who report to you. And that means your people know that they got to bring, bring their best game, their, their best to the game, because on any one issue, on any one day, your boss can go deeper than you um, and you need to be able to, to hang. So it's understanding each of your functions so well, where again, you could go to the center of the earth, uh, on the issue. And it's, sometimes it's hard, you know, these accounting matters are pretty esoteric and you need experts and you have experts, but you need to be able to go deep because ultimately you're the one responsible for each of your, you know, your functions and you got to have the intensity the work ethic and the ability to go as deep as anyone on any one issue. Not every one issue, because that doesn't scale, but any one issue. Again, you know, great, uh, great words of wisdom. Um, that is our time today. So I want to, I want to thank you, you know, very, very appreciative for everybody here at Mizuho for the audience. Thank you so much for spending the time sharing these thoughts and insights with us. And I wish you a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Great to see you.